Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Grand Rounds. Um, it's my pleasure today to uh, welcome one of our own, Dr. Lauren Wadsworth. Dr. Wadsworth is currently a postdoctoral fellow at McLean Hospital's College Mental Health Program and also the OCD Institute. She earned her uh, doctoral degree from the University of Massachusetts Boston where she studied mechanisms of change in cognitive behavioral and acceptance-based therapies for anxiety disorders. Her work here at McLean began actually back in 2013 where she worked for the Be Behavioral Health Partial Program. Throughout and after her practicum year, she aided the BHP in creating more culturally competent demographic and intake forms, work that extended across um, our campus. After her practicum year and throughout um, her internship year, she, she worked with colleagues to create a group treatment that aims to help patients understand the ways that their sociocultural identities impact their mood, mental health, and treatment. Her clinical work and research focuses on the treatment of severe anxiety disorders with a commitment to focusing on the need and importance of adapting treatments to be more culturally responsive. Today she's going to be presenting on research and clinical recommendations for working with individuals who belong to the sexual and or gender minority populations. And so she'll be speaking with us today on Beyond the Vocabulary, uh, diving deeper into sexual and gender minority clinical and research recommendations. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Wadsworth. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Palmer. I'm really excited to be talking here today at McLean because I love this place and I've been working here for a, a while, I guess a long time for me. Um, thank you for all being here and committing to learning more about working with sexual and gender minority populations. That's awesome that you're here. So one of my goals for this talk was to not spend 30 minutes on defining terms, what is transgender mean, what does bisexual mean, what does asexual mean, etc. So I've tried to skip over all of that and just give you a handout. So any terms you need to know should be on that um, page that was on your seat unless I go totally off course and knock my water bottle over. Um, and if so, I'll, I'll just define it as I go. I'm also going to be very brief in terms of providing the background and rationale for why to be talking about this topic because I'm assuming most of you are here because you already know. I have no disclosures to share. Do a brief background, which also is that handout that you have. Talk about research recommendations, um, specific things that you can implement in your lab tomorrow um, to make your measures more affirming for SGM individuals, which again means sexual and gender minority individuals, meaning we're talking about the sexuality spectrum and the gender spectrum today and as well as clinical recommendations. And my goal is that you'll have tons of takeaways for today. I'm not going to spend 45 minutes talking about why we need to talk about this and then five minutes trying to cram in some tips. I've tried to integrate it throughout and give a lot of examples so that hopefully you can have five to 15 things that you could do differently after walking out of here today. So as you probably are aware, sexual minority individuals, so anyone that's not heterosexual, experiences social and institutional prejudice and oppression, less social support, internalized shame, and sexual minority violence. These are the victims of the Pulse nightclub shooting. And experience greater anxiety and depression, higher levels, substance abuse, um, and higher suicide risks, especially as youths. Higher rates of anxiety disorders, one to five to two times higher than heterosexual individuals. In this order, a frequency, specific phobia, panic, GAD, and social. And internalized hom homophobia, internalizing that maybe it's not great for other people that I'm gay, increases the risk of more severe anxiety symptoms. So just one plug there of why this might be relevant in working clinically or in research with folks. Bisexual people, interestingly, and I'll show some more data to support this, experience higher rates of anxiety compared to gay, lesbian, and straight individuals. Um, the thought and research behind it is that they feel rejected from both communities and receive less social support even than gay and lesbian individuals. 
gender minorities, so we're talking about people that identify as trans, gender non-conforming, gender neutral, gender fluid, experience also social and institutional prejudice and oppression, anti-trans policies, gender-based violence, um, greater health disparities, both physical and mental health, anxiety and depression, same as sexual minority folks, greater substance use, and higher suicide rates, which is highest in all of these populations among trans people of color. Trans people experience higher rates of anxiety as well, and then this is the most common list. Interestingly, trans folks experience more social anxiety. It's higher in the list, if you noticed, as compared to sexual minority folks. This might be because of the visibility of transitioning, of expressing gender in a way that's outside of the typical binaries that people are used to seeing, um, so might be enduring more social stigma. Some interesting stats to share with, from Massachusetts. I wanted to show you a couple graphs from a recent study that came out because Massachusetts was the first state to legalize same-sex marriage, and a lot of us think, oh, we're pretty accepting here, and we are, relative to all other states in the country. There's a lot less oppression here for sexual and gender minority folks, and things are still really bad. So a couple of things to show you. Um, population of LGB youth compared to heterosexual youth, you can see that they're experiencing almost three times more helplessness, or, or three times more likely to experience sadness or hopelessness, um, almost, over five, almost five times more likely to consider attempting suicide, over three times more likely to make a suicide plan, and five times more likely to attempt suicide. This is in Massachusetts. So imagine what these numbers would look like in other areas of the country or the world. Transgender community experiences d discrimination in many public settings, 65% um, rating discrimination in the past year in a public setting by a stranger. And you can see how that's distributed, mostly public transportation, but pretty equally spread out across different settings. Younger people in Massachusetts are more likely to come out as gay, lesbian, or something else. So this is a really interesting graph. You probably would have imagined this, but you can clearly see that over the age span, there are much, much, much less people coming out in older cohorts, or have come out less that are in older cohorts. Um, for the, I think about 10 years, I started, 10 years ago, I started hearing the argument of, oh, everyone's coming out as gay, now it's making everyone gay. Um, probably it's more likely that there's less stigma and more people are coming out. I think this is pretty exciting and encouraging to see this massive jump um, between the 35 to 44 year olds up to 25 and 18 in terms of how accepted or um, willing people are to be coming out. More than a fifth um, people of um, sec uh, trans folks have identified that they've had a hate crime perpetuated perpetrated on the basis of their identity. Um, and, but I would like to point out that it's even higher in folks based on race. So it's not as frequent. Um, sexual orientation is here, gender identity is here. Race is the most common form of hate crime. And I'd like you to imagine how many folks have multiple of these marginalized identities, right? So it's not just this group compared to this group. But if someone identifies as a trans, a trans person of color, then you're multiplying those, those rates. OK, so just a couple more stats for you. 39% of Massachusetts LGBTQ adults um, ages 50 to 75 have been diagnosed with depression at some point in their lives. This is one of the, one of the only stats I've seen on older folks that identify as um, a sexual minority. And 32% of youth of color are underemployed, 15% unstably housed, and 31% food insecure. So some real physical dangers there, just probably, I think most of these have been shown that it's due to social, societal um, rejection, whether it's not being as likely to be hired for a job, but also the risk of coming out and not being supported by one's family, leading to homelessness and food insecurity. 17% of our trans people are living in poverty as of 2015. It's pretty shocking. 
So what does McLean want to know? I, I wanted to make this talk as relevant as possible to all of you sitting in this room. So I sent out a little questionnaire. You might have seen it pop through your in, um, inboxes, but maybe not because we get a lot of emails every day. Um, but I asked, what do you want to know about sexual and gender minority populations? So I'll just show you a couple bubbles. People were curious, what does asexual mean? How do I make my workplace more welcoming for SGM patients and employees, coworkers? Um, how can we unite the community in McLean and in our hospital system overall? How do you address patients when an, an issue arises around your own sexual orientation? And et cetera, et cetera. You had lots of questions. So I used all of these to inform what I'm about to talk about. So let's dive in. Research recommendations. I think you've, some of you have heard me talk about this a lot, but I think one of the most quick and influential things we can do that doesn't take a ton of bureaucratic paperwork in most situations is to include um, inclusive and affirming intake paperwork in processes. This can be as simple as updating your demographic questionnaire, and I'll give you a lot of examples of what you can do, um, and adding things into your workflow that I'll also provide more specifics on later. This is often a dilemma that we face as researchers, the balance between efficiency and accuracy, right? We'd all ideally like to include 400 questions in every questionnaire study that we do, and we know that there's burnout, and we need to be really careful about how much time we're asking people to spend on these demographic question, any questionnaire. So often people will say to me, okay, Lauren, that's great, but we don't really have time to ask all of these questions. So most studies measuring sexual orientation and other um, demographics often use an underrepresentative checkbox approach, something like this. What's your sexual orientation, heterosexual, gay, or lesbian? Sometimes folks will include bisexual, but that's about as broad as I've seen. In this example, folks who identify as bisexual, as queer, asexual, or some other sexual orientation have a couple options, and all of these are threats to the um, validity of our research. We could leave the item blank, not answer it. So, oh, some missing data, we expect that, right? But we might be actually missing a whole population. Checking a box that doesn't accurately reflect them, so that would be smushing yourself in, right? That also makes our data inaccurate. So if someone identifies as bisexual and says, okay, I'll just click lesbian, whatever, it's close enough, then that's not accurate data. So. Um, this also can have a negative effect, and often does, of signaling that these identities outside of straight, lesbian, and gay are not worth our time or our attention to be editing our forms, right? This is just too much of a hassle for psychologists and other researchers, which can alienate participants from coming back. Why should I invest my time in your research if you don't even know that I exist? And it can give the a, an idea of the degree to which our field, psychology, values them, right, and psychiatry. So what does it mean if you're a psychologist, your therapist, the researcher that's doing this groundbreaking research, hands you a form that doesn't even include your identity in it? That can feel pretty unsettling. So some studies have reported using um, another option, so having things like um, a write-in response. So, okay, if it's not listed, please write in how you identify. Um, I, I did a study on this and had used the, the word other in there, so other, please describe, and was given feedback that this was, for lack of a better word, othering and not comfortable. So the suggestion I was given was to use write in instead. Um, so what could this look like if you were super inclusive? Um, you can take a picture of this slide if that's helpful to you. Um, I'm also going to give you an article afterwards that you can read to start off with. But you can start with adding a much more comprehensive list of options and having that not listed option at the bottom. You can also do that for gender if you're feeling really brave. This seems to be terrifying for people, so I'll just name that. Um, I, don't, I guess I kind of know why, but it still kind of confuses me. And um, if we're going to be even more specific, we'd want to ask both gender and sex assigned at birth. Um, this is really important. This is where the question comes to mind of what are you trying to learn? What, why do you actually need this data? 
And if it's because there's some medical intervention where you need to know, is this person born with, was this person born with XY chromosomes or XX, then maybe you ask sex assigned at birth. If it's about how they've been socialized and how that their socialization might relate to anxiety, like if you're looking at gender differences of anxiety disorders, maybe you want to know gender expression and at what ages were they expressing different genders, right? So it can get really complex. Um, including the option of intersex has been something that's been recently recommended um, pretty often. A lot of individuals are born with ambiguous uh, genitalia at birth. Historically, those folks were operated on oftentimes without parents even knowing or consenting and then grow up to then develop um, secondary sex characteristics that are also ambiguous. And there's a bigger push now to stop those surgeries and allow people to have this intersex label. And many folks identify with that. Um, if you wanted to be even more brave, you can ask folks if they identify as intersex or having a difference of sex development. So this would be like in my ideal world how we would start um, doing demographic forms. And if you think about it, this does take a little bit more of the screen and a little bit more paper, but it probably doesn't take very much more time, right? It's not like the patient's going to be like, oh no, all these options, what do I pick, right? They know. They know how they identify. They'll be able to see it really quick. For some folks, they'll be like, this is annoying, why do we need all these terms, right? And that's okay. That's actually a great moment where we can use our privilege to educate people and just plant that little seed of, oh, there are other folks in the world. Interesting. Maybe I'll go Google that later secretly without anyone knowing. <laughs> so I don't actually think it takes a lot more time. And I think the benefit that we can get in terms of welcoming participants, making them feel um, affirmed, and also the impact that this would have on your first clinical session with someone, I think is totally worth the time and the energy. So if you would like a place to start, um, some folks at UMass and I have published a demographic form. I believe I put this on the back of your handout. Um, it's, access, it's free, it's accessible online. If you just Google the title, you'll see the behavior therapist journal that it's in, and it's included in an appendix. So you can just make it into a Word document and start there. I'd say it's extremely comprehensive, so I recommend it as like a take what you need and want for your research approach. And I'll say that it needs updating. It was published in 2015, 2016, and a lot has changed since then. There are many more ways people are identifying, and that will continue to happen. So I'd encourage you to take this as a starting place, but update it from what you learned today and what you've learned in other places. So just a little plug of why do this. In that study I mentioned, we asked people if they identified some other way aside from lesbian, gay, or bisexual, and found that on all measures of social anxiety in Boston, folks who identified as lesbian, gay, and heterosexual all had the same amount of social anxiety. So if we hadn't included those other options, we wouldn't have even seen this really interesting effect. Um, not what we hypothesized. We thought that lesbian and gay folks would have higher social anxiety. I think this points out to how Boston is doing pretty well in terms of discrimination and getting ahead of a lot of other places. Um, but the important thing here is that we see this whole other, two other populations emerge with significantly different levels of social anxiety on every subscale of the LSAS. And the write-in group and bisexual group being those two categories. But that's just the thing. Anyone could run that analysis in about 10 minutes um, if you have those data. And whatever your questions are, this could be a really important publication or just paragraph of your study that would make it stand out from a lot of other studies being published now. So this collecting more accurate and affirming demographic forms can benefit you because you can ask more identity-related questions. You can look at subgroup differences between sexual and gender minority folks and non-minority folks. You can look at if the severity rates are different in whatever you're studying. If there's a different rate of age of onset, that might be interesting. Um, do SGM folks respond as well to this treatment? 
would be good to know. Um, do they endorse higher levels of risk factors that I think are related to the area of study, like higher substance use, home instability, low family or social support, low SES in my sample? Those might be really important covariates that you need to consider, right? Or might make your um, data much more clear and easy to understand. And by any, doing any of this work, you would also be contributing to helping the visibility and field of this literature move forward. There's a huge lack. So anything that you can publish would be a huge contribution, even if it's just one little line in your study. Even just reporting the demographic table is still a huge thing to do. Just one caveat, if you're going to do this, be very specific in who you're referring to. I've seen, I've reviewed lots of papers that have said, we're looking at DBT and LGBTQ folks, um, but they're only looking at sexual minority individuals, not the T, and they only asked if people are lesbian, gay, or bi. So be as specific as your data are limited. If you only measured sexual orientation, just say LGB or sexual minority. Um, I would say to avoid using the umbrella term altogether unless you have, cre you have included that not listed category so that you can actually um, be pretty confident that you're capturing these domains accurately. Okay, let's move to some clinical recommendations. I know I'm flying a little fast, but I want to pack as much in as I can. Okay, so to get started, how many people have heard of the addressing acronym? Okay, about half. I'm going to go through it very quickly. It's a framework that was developed by Dr. Pamela Hayes. She's a psychologist in Alaska. And she has had a whole career on talking about socio and cultural identities and how they interact with mental health symptoms and treatments and wanted to create a framework so that patients and um, clinicians could talk about identity in a structured way. So she created this acronym that gives you a starting point to think about how are the many ways that I identify and my patients or my participants identify. So this includes age, disability status, diagnosis like mental health, religion and spirituality, ethnicity and race, which are two separate constructs historically conflated. So just want to point out there that they would require two different answers or an answer for each, I'd say. Socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, indigenous heritage and immigration status, nation of origin, citizenship status, and gender and gender expression. So there's a lot packed into here. Everyone in this room has an identity within almost all of these letters. The only one is indigenous heritage and immigration status where some people might not have one of those. Um, within it, but we all have identities across these many domains. So thinking about the ways that these identities intersect within ourselves and also intersect in our patients and might overlap. Intersectionality is a word you've probably heard described a lot. It basically means that these identities aren't like different columns holding up a building. There are these interacting constructs that create unique identities within them. So being um, queer or bisexual isn't the same for every bisexual or queer person, right? It's different if you identify as devotely Catholic or Mormon or you're a person of color or both or all three, right? So each intersection creates a new experience. Um, so for example, if we're using this framework and talking about sexual minority folks, you can imagine um, a Chinese woman and she has She's second generation, so her parents immigrated to the country. I don't know if that's first or second. Second? Okay, first. First generation. Thank you. Sounded wrong. And she's working in a male-dominated field. She's in a law firm, and she identifies as bisexual. Feels uncomfortable with being, being closeted, but worries that coming out might bring some rejection socially or job-wise from her male colleagues. Um, but then, because, and feels that that is really important because her parents really want her to succeed financially and they really value that. So having this conflict of values might 
might influence as a clinician your recommendation to her coming out or not at work. So it's really important for us to think about many different aspects. And this just highlighted, I think, four, five. Um, but you could probably imagine situations where you could cover the whole acronym. So to provide some clinical takeaways, I'm going to talk about one case that I worked on and use it to bring up a lot of different points. So this was a 19-year-old Asian college sophomore that I worked with who grew up in a lower middle class family and reported that they wanted treatment for anxiety, social stressors, and passive suicidal ideation. So my first assumption was I read the paperwork and it said female, so I assumed that was the patient's identity. So at the end of the first session I had said, or like midway through, I'd said, oh, I was reflecting back, oh, as your father's daughter, you felt a lot of pressure to X, Y, Z. 20 minutes later, at the end of the session, I asked if there's anything else would be helpful for me to know. And the patient shared that they might identify as trans, and they prefer they, them pronouns. So I was kind of like, oops, that was huge, right? I didn't even need to use that example. Like, why did I do that, right? And I kind of got stuck on that for a second. Like, why did I even need to use gender as an example? But then I learned that apologizing when you make mistakes is probably even more powerful than not having the situation happen at all, right? So even the most culturally competent clinician in the world is going to keep making mistakes, doing things like misgendering a patient or saying something offensive or heterosexist or assuming things about someone's life. Um, and SGM folks are likely more sensitive to rejection or micro or macro aggressions because of a history of being rejected and micro and macro, uh, macro aggressed against. So mistakes are going to happen. Patients who hold marginalized identities are probably more likely to notice those mistakes. Um, I'd say many times, well, I've learned and experienced many times waiting for it to happen. So not only like being more sensitive to it, but kind of waiting to see, oh, this person isn't actually safe. I knew it, right? So it's really important for us to be willing to be vulnerable in apologizing for those mistakes. And by doing that, we're using our relative position of power as the clinician or the researcher and saying, okay, I'm going to apologize, take myself down a couple pegs, and see where this goes. Okay. Another tip, go beyond the initial intake paperwork. So I could have also done better in this example by introducing myself and asking the per person the name and pronouns that they go by. Try not to assume the pronouns that someone uses. Just ask. Um, so instead of, I've been recently informed that instead of saying what are your preferred pronouns, it can be more affirming to say what pronouns do you use or go by. So it makes it sound less like a preference, like the whole sexual preference makes it sound like I'm choosing to be gay, right? Wouldn't really choose to have a marginalized identity, perhaps. Um, so also saying what are your pronouns can just be a more affirming and stable way, um, stabilizing way of asking that question. So I might say, have said, hi, I'm Dr. Wadsworth. What name would you like me to call you, and what pronouns do you use? And pronouns can change. So this isn't a foolproof method. It's not like one and done. There are many, many reasons why pronouns might change. Um, a patient might express different pronouns over the course of treatment as they become more comfortable with you. Right? If I said that right away, the patient might have just said, I don't know, um, this is my name and she, hers, and been scared to come out as potentially trans and using they, them pronouns. So I get that too. Maybe it needed to happen at the end of that first session. Maybe that was the earliest it could have possibly happened. So know that even if you ask, you might get a different answer in a week or a day or a month or years into treatment and be open to that doesn't mean they were lying or that they didn't trust you. They kind of didn't trust you, but that's OK. It's understandable. Um, and their identity might shift. So people can go by multiple pronouns at a time. Um, I think, yeah, I'll just put these all up here so you can read them. So someone might change to realizing that they identify as male 
or gender fluid or gender nonconforming. That might be a reason pronouns change. Um, people that are gender fluid can have a pronoun shift within a day or across hours. So that is something that you should also anticipate. If someone says they identify as gender fluid, they might feel more male in the morning and more female at night. So it's not, the pronouns might not always be a stable thing for that person, they can change. Okay. One way that you can use your privilege for good today, right after this talk, is to put your pronouns in your email signature line. So this is what my email signature line looks like. And you can see that it's not this like huge glaring Broadway sign, right? It doesn't have to be a big deal, but it can be a way that we can force a little bit of space in the world. And like, I think about it as like dynamite through a mountain to make a new road. So that individuals, so that we're normalizing talking about pronouns. So that your colleague that identifies as gender fluid or gender nonconforming or trans, can do this too, and it's not like the only person in the office doing it, right? They don't have to come out by putting their pronouns or talking about pronouns. You could just make pronouns a normal thing, and then they can come out or not, right? It's an, a nice way to increase safety if you hold privilege in this area. Okay, so later in treatment, or the same day, um, the patient, no, sorry, later in treatment, the patient expressed a strong desire to not be referred to as um, female by strangers, family, or friends, and wondered if they should get top surgery. So here I was like, I know, I'm okay with this, like I'm totally an ally, and I will help this patient become their best trans self, right? Okay, assumption. I thought that my job was to help him decide if he was trans and if he would like to transition. So I was like, let's do this, I'm totally a supporter, um, and I, I'd be problem solving with him and then anytime we'd got to like close to a strong firm decision about like okay let's only do the male bathroom for now or no more dresses like all pants no makeup like whatever we'd get to I'd notice that the patient would just like jump away from that all of a sudden like oh but sometimes I like to wear dresses oh but sometimes like I don't mind if people see me as a little feminine what does that mean and it took me way too long to notice this pattern. I kept thinking like, yes, gender is a spectrum, but like, let's get to the goal, right? Too, a little too CBT oriented sometimes. I learned ultimately that my job was to validate the stress that the client felt existing in a world with boxes that they didn't fit into. So just spending time with validating this moment that they were experiencing every day. And to create a safe and supportive place where they didn't feel required to re choose a gender. So that this room that I was working with them in, not this room, but they would come in and then not have to be super male or super feminine or super in between, that it could just be the place that they're them. And I could be the one person that's not like waiting for them to tell me the final decision so we can move on with it, right? And I was kind of doing that before. So this was another big point of, of learning, that it was more about validating that in-between space and then seeing where we went from there. Empower them and ex um, to help them discover ways that they could express their gender that felt right to them. And maybe that was saying, I'm not in any of these boxes. And that's okay, it's hard, and it's okay. So when planning next steps, if someone does identify as trans and would like to go through some form of transition, some things I would like you to think, keep in mind. Be careful not to impose your, cultural, your culture or your values. I was also doing this by like, I'm a person that likes to get to the end of something and like, I don't know, do things a certain way. I was assuming that they wanted to look a specific gender. I was assuming we were aiming for male or female. That was a mistake, right? Maybe it was that I was uncomfortable with the in-between and I was trying to get us to a more comfortable space for me. Um, so try to notice what you think the best option is and, what, and ask yourself, is that in line with my culture or the way I was raised? And do I 
should I take a step back? Um, note that not everyone that identifies as trans wants to pursue a medical intervention. People may do one or the following. They may change clothing, haircut, or physical appearance, train their voice up or down, take hormones, have top surgery, have bottom surgery, but just know that an individual does not need to do any of the above changes to be a real woman, a real man, or a real non-conforming person. If a person does express a desire to go forward with any of those steps on the previous page, I think that it's our duty as clinicians to do our homework and look up regional and statewide laws of what they need to do to go through those processes and have that ready for the next session. What documentation, what letters, they're already going through enough with their families and social supports and work. Like if we can take away some of that administrative work, why not? Um, and maybe share that with your colleagues so they don't have to keep reinventing the world wheel. Help patients navigate potential roadblocks like financial risks of coming out or expressing their gender in a different way, rejection by family or social supports, workplace discrimination, etc. Um, we also can help patients cope with identity related and non identity related stressors. And I'll jump into this in a little more detail. So when we're working with folks who hold marginalized identities across that whole acronym, I think one of the most powerful things we can do as clinicians is help them note what stress they're experiencing related to their identity and externalize that to where it belongs on society, right? So to note the pain of having a person use a racial slur against you or misgendering you, that pain, finding it with the patient, and then saying, okay, this doesn't have to sit in you and live in you. This isn't your fault. This isn't something inherently wrong with you. This is something that's wrong with society right now that's making your interaction with that society very uncomfortable. So that pain, we get to put it out there. It's still, you still feel it in here, but it's not because of you. Do you know what I mean? Okay, and we'll go through some examples. Before we do that, I just want to take a moment to connect this to our daily lives a bit. Marginalization, of course, happens in a big way with genocide and bias-motivated violence. Um, we also experience discrimination, and then smaller things like macroaggressions, individual acts of prejudice, or bias. That's where implicit bias and um, microaggressions come in, things that we don't even notice are harmful. So what I'm going to do is go through an example of, of something that I think is on the lower half of this pyramid. And surprise, surprise, we encounter it every day, and it's Facebook. So f this is an example that I'm going to have a couple of my colleagues have volunteered to read out loud, which I really appreciate, because it's hard to read. Um, this was a post in response to um, New York City offering a third gender option on birth certificates. So offering adults who identify as non-conforming to say gender is X so they don't have to choose male or female and they can be outside of that binary, which is super awesome. And I was like, yay, the world's getting better. And then I read what the original poster had written, um, pray for our country, this makes me sick. So sometimes you choose your battles. I asked, you know, why does this make you sick? just to see how they would describe that, right? I wanted to understand. So I'm gonna have um, my colleagues read out loud the, an exchange that followed. And between, I'll point out some of the very frequent micro and macro aggressions that SGM folks, your patients, your friends, your colleagues are experiencing as they scroll through something as simple as Facebook. Okay. He never said gay people were gross. He is of the belief that two people of the same sex being involved in sexual acts together is gross and inappropriate. Big difference in context. My boys know where I stand with same gender attraction. They know it's wrong in God's eyes. Will I still love them if they ended up gay? Yes, but they also know where I stand. Let's test your resolve and open beliefs. What would you say to bestiality or pedophilia? So these are things that, that I see pretty often on Facebook. I think it's easy for us to scroll past or block the person. Um, and I appreciate you both putting voice to this. Um, some of the points I want to point out, just to imagine if you were a 
teen that was coming out or an adult that's out, what it would feel like to read these things. Um, so being called gross or inappropriate, this mixed message from a parent of, I accept you, but it's wrong, right? What kind of cognitive dissonance is that? That's so complicated for a kid to unpack. It almost feels, that's a great example of it's in you. Like, I accept you, but you're wrong. Like, go deal with that, right? And then this common occurrence of switching to, okay, well, if we're going to go that far and accept all that, what about bestiality and pedophilia, which is an extremely offensive thing to say. Okay, one more. Also, this is all totally based on severe mental illness. The LGBTQQ slash WTF community has made this a social issue. I remember when a tranny was a tranny, and everyone and their dog knew that the person was mentally jacked up and needed help. Now it's a damn popularity contest. It's still wrong, and we who oppose it are shouted down in the name of bigotry or racism or something stupid like that. So a huge intersection, right? Sexual minority, gender minority folks, racism, all of this being called into question, being called out as something made up. And then just thinking about how would that feel? How does that shift your allostatic load for the day? I know that it shifted mine a lot for a couple days, and it does every time I hear this. So these moments are quick and frequent and occurring, and they're happening every day. They're probably not things that your patient's going to come in and say, oh, this Facebook post happened. But what is it like for them to absorb that on a daily basis, and how can you counteract or help them cope with those experiences? I think one thing that we can do is acknowledge that we're aware that homophobia and transphobia exist. Knowing what a microaggression is might be something like, I couldn't even tell you were trans. You're so pretty. What macroaggressions are, it's being kicked out of a bathroom. Systemic oppression, like the removal of state protection and trans individuals in the workplace, which was on the ballot here in Massachusetts. Um, and identify that separation of this pain is due to societal beliefs and stigma. And help them externalize that pain as a problem within society and not a problem within me. So. I'd like to just go one step further and help talk about how can we be a little more prepared and ahead of the ball when someone comes in and says they have anxiety. How can we kind of delve a little deeper, especially if we are guessing or they have told us that they're a sexual or gender minority patient? So we can explore fears more deeply before assuming they're an anxiety disorder, just like their general categories. So if someone says, I'm scared to go into crowded places, we might think agoraphobia. I don't like to use public bathrooms, social anxiety. Um, and we could just go on and on, right? But if we ask what informs that fear, we might get to know that there could be some marginalization at play here. So I'm scared to go into crowded spaces. And if I said, what informs that? What experiences have you had? They might say, because so many people look at me closely and some point and stare, right? Very different treatment all of a sudden as opposed to exposure. I don't like to use public bathrooms because it makes other people uncomfortable, right? Another very different treatment than social anxiety by the book. So what could we do? Can be aware of using cognitive restructuring as is. So if we just use the typical tools, we might we'd be asking, do you know for certain that people point and stare? Do you, are you 100% sure? What evidence do you have? What's the worst that could happen? Okay, enter gender-based violence um, stats. The worst that can happen is death. Um, do you have a crystal ball? How bad is that? Is there another explanation? Right, this can be pretty invalidating. And it can increase the pain. It can make them feel again like it's their responsibility to suck it up and get through this, think about it differently, let's move on. And can signal that you don't see that there's marginalization at play or understand that that's what this issue might be about. And again, I'm not saying this is the case for everyone, of course, but to be considerate that this could be a whole pop subset of your clinical population. Um, so how could you adapt cognitive restructuring? You could start with, that sounds uncomfortable for you too. Can you tell me more about what's happened in the past? Well, women stare at me, examine my chest to see if I'm a woman, I think, because they're scared I'm a dude in the women's room. I don't feel like I fit in in the women's room or the men's room. 
And this is a real, this is like a quote verbatim from somebody. So you could respond with something like, wow, that sounds like a lot that you have to think about just to use the bathroom. So it's like a little bit of validation 2.0. So you're not just saying that sounds hard, but you're kind of identifying the marginalization, uh, marginalization piece. I'm sorry it's like that. Seems like the world wasn't set up in a way that's comfortable for you, and that's unfortunate. It's definitely not your responsibility to make other people feel at ease around you. It should be that way already. Given this pain, so up to that, it's like identifying marginalization, validation, right? Like this is hard and it shouldn't be that way. But then I think we do have a responsibility to help the person cope, right? So given this pain and the ways you are now, oh, the way things are now in society, can we think about ways that you can navigate the world in a safe way so you can enjoy outings in other places where you might need to use the restroom, right? You can imagine that this person might meet criteria for agoraphobia or panic disorder because they're avoiding every place where there's a public bathroom or a situation might come up. So it is really important for us to target this, to help the person navigate this world with two boxes oftentimes so that they can do behavioral activation, right? If we just skip to go out, socialize, passive active social act, um, socializing, then we might just be hit, having them hit up against a wall every day. So I think it's really important for us to identify and target marginalized experiences. Um, I'll quickly go through internalized stigma. Um, if someone says that they are a disappointment because they're attracted to women, I wish I wasn't, we can um, ask a little bit more of where these experiences come from and help them get a better understanding. So say this person said, well, my parents told me they're disappointed in me because I'm gay. And then help them break it down beyond that. This is like, in my, ex think of it as like a downward arrow approach in CBT, but for identities. So my parents told me they were disappointed that I'm gay. That's where it started. Um, my parents have those beliefs because of what they were taught is normal and what they've always expected of me. I felt shame after my parents said this. However, my girlfriend and friends don't see me as a disappointment, so I don't deserve that label 100% or globally. And then kind of taking it out one more step, I'm sad my parents are disappointed I'm gay, but that doesn't mean I'm a bad person. So I do think we can use a lot of the cognitive restructuring skills and the creativity that we have as clinicians to tackle this. I think it just takes a little bit of bravery to jump in the pool. Um, but with a little practice, it gets a lot easier really quick. Um, I'm going to breeze through the last few slides so we have a couple minutes for questions. Um, be really careful when you're encouraging patients to come out. This came up with the patient that I was working with, um, wanting to come out so they didn't have to keep stressing about it. But it's important to think about a few things. Um, the stuff in red are the dangers, and the green is the, the benefits. Staying closet is closeted increases the external locus of control. There's a greater fear of negative evaluation. Benefit is you experience less discrimination and you have um, another downside of depression and anxiety being increased. As opposed to coming out, which also has pluses and minuses, risk of social loss, work school harassment, um, increased discrimination, but there is a benefit of decreased anxiety and depression afterwards. So this is a great time to bring in the addressing model, right? Think about what is a person's SES, what is the person's religion, what do their family, what does their family believe, well, how are they probably going to react to this, is it safe to come out or not? And then helping them navigate the yes or the no or the maybe in the future. Coming out is a lifelong process. Um, for a lot of folks, they have to come out every time they meet a new person. This is the case for me. So it's not just a one and done out of the closet, right? It's, it's an every time or frequent occurrence. Um, be very careful with family involvement. You might know things about the patient's identity that the parents don't. So an example is pronouns, right? If you're, the mom calls in because they want to know how their kid's doing in the inpatient program, um, trying to not use gender pronouns if the person is a gender minority, right? Try to just say their name over and over in case the kid hasn't come out to their parent, but they've come out to you. Um, try not to give any information um, back to families because that might be extremely dangerous for the kid. It's happened in many clinics that I've heard of where it is a huge explosion. So 
I would just put that in your minds. If someone's come out to you, that's an honor, and try really hard to not really out someone, if you can, to other people. That might risk all of the things we talked about earlier today. And if, as a side note, if they are out and experiencing family stress, it might not be in their best interest right now to help them come back together with their family. That's probably healthy in the long term, but think carefully about if that's the best thing to do in the here and now. Okay, beware of overgeneralizing. Everyone's different. We're all complex. You all know this. Um, do your homework. Expand the articles that you read. Try to get out of your comfort zone. Do occasional web searches. So oftentimes people will ask me to come talk on what are the new ways people are identifying in the sexual and gender minority field. Well, let me Google that for you. <laughs> I have to Google it like every three months, so why don't we all Google it every six months and then we'll be good to go, right? There are so many awesome comprehensive lists online that we can um, benefit from. You can bring safe zones training to your department. If you hate reading more than you do now, YouTube is awesome. Um, some suggestions, Trans 101, Queer Education, great channels where you can learn about new terms and have people grappling with these discussions who identify this way. Create a living document in your department of supports for SGM individuals. It's very important to have things like community support. That's one of the best cures or um, aids to experiencing marginalization is talking to other people who have experienced it too and learning ways to um, navigate it. And also a great way for trans folks to learn about medical interventions if that's something they're considering. Um, can be nice to just hear from people that have had the experience. Be cognizant if you can of finding groups that are in line with the person's religious affiliation or other ethnic group or um, racial identity because that can enhance the benefits even further. But I will say that finding these supports is especially hard for SGM folks who are people of color. It's really hard to find groups. Um, if the person has a lot of social anxiety or they're not comfortable coming out, you could encourage them to create a new Facebook profile and that's anonymous and join online groups. On Facebook, there are tons in the Boston area. If they're kind of half a toe in, half a toe out, then having them join those Facebook groups would probably be easier than going to Sydney Borum for a group, for example. So that's also a nice place to start, especially if there's social anxiety in the mix. Okay, um, I don't think I have to go through the summary because you seemed like most of you are awake. So I'll just end with, it's our job as clinicians and researchers to be the broker of the conversation of identity in our offices. We have the power in that, in terms of what we're gonna talk about. So even doing something like adding the addressing acronym with some lines after each one, to your demographic form or your intake could be a nice way to just say, I know these things exist. Um, so I think we have like two minutes for questions, so I apologize. I just wanted to pack as much in as possible. And thank you all for listening. Any questions? Thank you very much for this uh, lecture. I feel very ignorant, uh, but I know a bit more with your lecture. I, will, I like to think about myself like somebody who is open-minded, but still, you know, I, I feel very comfortable asking patients uh, what name you like me to call you but asking what pronouns uh, you want to be addressed with, what you prefer. Even before this lecture, uh, I will say if my doctor or primary care asks me what pronouns you want me to use, or you, I look at her and say, what are you saying? So I'm afraid that some patient will be turned off from asking that. How is me or what's your experience? You have much more experience than me, of course. No, I'm seeing a lot. Though of I have patients who use they, yeah. and uh, that was very instructive for me. It was a female who used, sees herself as a they. Yeah, and I, I respected that. Yeah, I appreciate your question. I saw a lot of nods. I too 
felt uncomfortable and often feel uncomfortable, like asking pronouns. Um, I think if I had to guess, our fears are this will make them more uncomfortable. Maybe this isn't beneficial for their care right now to confuse them or have this like other thing we have to talk about, right? Um, when I've talked to a lot of groups, there'll be a mixed reaction. Half will say, yeah, it is really hard, it's uncomfortable, we usually avoid it. Um, the other half will say, we've been doing it, it hasn't been an issue, surprisingly. Um, and so I'd, my opinion is that it is hard to do. It's hard to create a whole new um, formality and introductions and language. It's hard to like insert that into our culture. And I would say, if we're not going to do it, then who will? You know, if we value this, if we think this could be helpful for patients and maybe even reduce stigma about people identifying outside of male or female or identifying with pronouns that you might not ascribe to them, then I think it's time that we do it. Um, I think the more people that do it all at once, the better, right? Like if each of us walked out today and tried it for our first three patients that we saw, our research participants, it might create a faster, more, um, a wave that would catch on faster. I think it's hard when it's one individual within a unit. So I wonder about things like changing unit policies. So it's that, oh, I'm asking because this is our thing that we do in this um, clinic because a lot of our patients don't identify with the pronouns we'd guess, right? So you could blame the clinic. Um, and that also probably has a really big impact on the person as well. This clinic does affirm me. And for the folks that are really confused, don't get it, are annoyed by the question, that's going to happen at some point, most likely in the next five years, hopefully. Um, so I think we're just going to be the first ones doing it, but it's going to be a more and more common occurrence. But yeah. Thanks for the great talk. How do you handle, you, you did it beautifully in the talk t with us today, patients' curiosity and questions about you in, in, in terms of uh, treatment? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I never know, I don't know that answer yet myself in terms of if I should come out to patients or not. I usually don't, but I usually put lots of little signs throughout my office, like little rainbow things. You'll see all my folders are arranged in rainbow order, and I have rainbow magnets and LGBTQ, like an equal sign. Um, if I'm having a hard time, if I'm thinking that the person is afraid to come out to me or um, afraid to come out to anyone and this might actually really benefit them to see someone in a relative power position that's out and gainfully employed, almost, um, <laughs> still a postdoc, then, then I will come out. I'll say it in some, some way or, um, and it's been interesting. I thought that that would cause people to ask me a lot of follow-up questions, but most will be like, cool. And then <laughs> we move on, which is interesting. Um, so I've, I've explored with it many different ways. And so far, um, I don't have one answer for every person. But if a person was to ask many, many questions, I'd just say, we're going to need to move on back to you, you know, um, as best I could. But yeah, it can be really powerful at times. But I tend to skirt it a little bit because people don't assume that I'm queer. And um, if I can like surprise them with it in a good way, in a powerful moment that feels like it's for them, I think that has more impact than saying it right away. Yeah. OK, thank you, everyone. If you have more questions, I'll be up here.